Okay, we are live, but we got to let it breathe just for a moment here. Hang tight, y'all. Bring on Facebook, and we will get things cooking. And we are good. Welcome in, everybody. It's the Mile High Huddle Podcast, and I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, Zach Kelberman. You know him. You love him. Zach, bro, the Denver Broncos, of course, using up as many of their spots on their uh, top 30 visits as possible. They're they're going to bring in a running back tomorrow. Uh, obviously, that's a priority to Sean Payton because it's not the first running back they've been linked to this offseason. Break it down real quick. Yeah, it's actually the second in as many weeks. Last week, there was a report, which I wrote up, that said the Broncos have a good amount of interest in uh, Tennessee running back Jalen Wright. Tomorrow, they'll be hosting Kentucky running back Ray Davis on an official top 30 visit. Davis was a uh, second team all SEC last year. He had 1,100 plus yards. 21 total touchdowns, which was a school record for Kentucky, seven receiving scores. He made all 13 starts. He's kind of a bigger back. He's 5'11", or 5'8", 2'11", excuse me. Uh, not, <laughs> I guess we got some footage of him. Not the biggest guy, but he can definitely catch out of the backfield. I, you know, Sean Payton loves his Alvin Kamara types, and I don't know that he's ex as explosive as Kamara, Chad, but he definitely is a dual threat option. Yeah, he looks like he could be a nice little fit for uh, a Sean Payton offense, especially if you get a uh, competent quarterback. Not to say that Russ was incompetent. That would be doing him a little too much, a little too dirty. But let's just say a quarterback who uh, can shine, Zach, in a in a Payton scheme, the, the kind of scheme we know Sean Payton is about. We talked about this yesterday when it came to Bo Nix about his lack of arm strength or at least relative to the other prospects. But in a Sean Payton system, you're going to have running backs get open in the middle of the field, crossers and dump offs. We saw that so often with Russell Wilson last year. The problem was that was the first read for Russell Wilson. Fortunately, with a quarterback like Bo Nix, he'll see everyone in the middle of the field and target them appropriately. Scott, what's his uh, round projection? Ray Davis. I mean, what do you think? Fourth round pick, third round pick, later fifth. Interesting. Well, Broncos doing their due diligence. It's not necessarily a top 30 visit, Zach, because they're expected to take him in the top 30, but this is their last like opportunity to spend a little additional time with the prospects on their short list. And it's obvious that they have a, um, a, a need or at least a priority at running back. You just wonder how that running back, no matter who it is, whether it's Ray Davis or Jalen Wright, who's probably a day two guy, where they're going to fit in. They have four running backs under contract. We know the top three with Pookie, P. Ryan and McLaughlin. They also have Tyler Beatty, Batty, whatever, who they're high on. So it's going to be interesting to see where the backfield splits go if they do draft one, which is looking like a likelihood. Guys, lots, an exciting podcast tonight. We have the Duchess, Michaela Parker, in the house. We're going to bring her on in just a moment. Before we do, though, I want to grab this generous super chat from Sam Bam, and then we're going to talk to Michaela and get some of her thoughts on the key issues and in, in the main title and topic of tonight's podcast, <clears throat> plus what she expects to see happen in the draft coming up here very soon. But Sam, thank you, brother. Really appreciate the super chat. He Thank says, you, evening, guys, podcast and then the championship game. If UConn wins tonight, I win a bunch of bracket pools I'm in. Sick, dude. By far my best March Madness year ever. So go Broncos and go UConn 17 days till the draft. Hey, dog, I'll, I'll become a UConn guy for you for one night. No problem. That's really cool, man. Fingers crossed. Yeah, Sam, thank you for sharing. And uh, I don't have a, a horse in this race. I don't have a bracket this year. But for your sake, I am definitely hoping that UConn pulls it off. All right, let's uh, let's let's bring on Michaela. And you know, this is somebody obviously near and dear to everybody's hearts, including the Rock here, who jumped in early with some stars. Uh, but she needs a little introduction from us. Everybody knows Michaela Parker quite well. She uh, w right before we went live, we were chit chatting, and she, and I called her the Duchess, and she's like, "Where did that nickname come from?" And I had to remind her that it came from the community. It came from you guys, nicknamed her that, and and so we. It stuck with us, and we've been calling her that ever since. And uh, she's been to the all the meet and greets. I mean, she's she's MHH family. Let's put it that way. So, without further ado, Michaela Parker in the house, the Duchess. Love you, Michaela. So stoked you could make time for us tonight. How are you? I'm doing uh, very well, thank you. Hello, family. That's right. And Scott will get any uh, specific messages, and they don't have to be supers. Queued up. Uh, if you guys have anything you want to say to 
to Michaela. But uh, first things first, Michaela, I mean, it's been uh, since last, I mean, obviously we've, we've talked to you here and there for, in the chats at, in, you know, in every stream, you and I will DM back and forth on Twitter and whatnot, but a lot's happened since we really had a, a conversation, which has to date all the way back to the, the meet and greet, which I'll remind everybody was the spark. Let's face it. The football gods were like, you know what? This this team of the Broncos does not move one inch further forward until Mile High Huddle has boots on the ground and the meet and greet is is in the books. Then and only then will we allow this team to go on any kind of a run. And they did. But a lot's changed, Michaela. So first things first, we'll get to some of the like hot topics of the moment. But how are you feeling now that a, a good month or so has passed since the, the Broncos officially pulled the trigger on moving on from Russ? Well, I mean, I think uh, overall it was pretty much a bad marriage, a bad relationship. It was not meant to be. No, it wasn't. And, mm -mm, I mean, two different persons. Uh -oh. Uh oh, she froze up. She froze up. Uh, it's a cliffhanger there. Oh, there oh we go. now she's back. She's back. We're good. Sorry. It's okay. Finish that thought, though, that you were on right before you Oh, I up. said that it was just a bad marriage, bad uh, bad mix altogether. It's like different personalities. So, I mean, it, it wasn't meant to be. But you could say the breakup was pretty much inevitable. Charge it to the game, so to speak. Uh, Zach, I know you've got a question, but I'm just going to read this from uh, That's funny. Uh, MBL, M MBLX test prep. She froze like Russ when asked to throw in the middle of the field. <laughs> That's a good one, Zach. Uh, Michaela, Desert Creatures here, hyping you up as he should. We're so happy to have you. And I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just really excited to ask you this question. And if you'll allow me to kind of push you out of your comfort zone, because we know that you take a more – I don't want to say negative approach to the 2024 Broncos prospects, but Michaela, give me something that encourages you. Give me something that you like about the process of this year's Broncos. I'm really looking forward to the draft. Uh, let's say new beginnings. It's always exciting. Yeah. Hopefully a better quarterback. Well, I don't think uh, the Broncos can afford not to draft one in the first round. Absolutely. There would be to a complete uh, uprising in Broncos country. Michaela, uh, Luke Patterson has a story coming very soon on uh, milehighhuddle.com about Zach Allen, of course, defensive end, who, you know, he was a part of the offseason moves in the sense that, you know, he restructured his contract to help the Broncos get under the cap in the face of releasing Russell Wilson and that punitive 85 dead uh, million in dead money etc and he was asked recently about the moves the broncos have made and i just want to get your thoughts on this real quick he said via uh, ctinsider.com quote it wasn't the year we wanted but in some aspects it was still successful and we hope to keep going up and up and then he went on to talk about how quote necessary changes are being made again this is zach allen quote coach payton is awesome He's the real deal, and the Walton family have been awesome with the investment in the team. They care about everything and everyone. So whatever it is, close quote, whatever, Michaela, the message that Sean Payton has been preaching to the team about these moves, they might be painful but necessary. At least we know Zach Allen's on board, but I wonder how much of the locker room shares his kind of uh, – would echo his, his, his words. I mean, it's hard to say. I haven't – heard much uh, uh, chitter chatter from players. So I think Zach Allen should lead by example. He's one of the highest paid players on the team, Chad, and he really didn't step up until the, the latter part of last season. So it really starts with him. I don't want to hear about how great the Waltons are. I want to see them play better on the field. Mika Michaela, you've heard us talk about quarterbacks for months now. I'm wondering if you have a specific quarterback that you would prefer in this draft. <sighs> I think I would love Drake May. Will that happen? No. I mean, I like, uh, I think J.J. McCarthy and Bo Nix are like 2A and 2B. I mean, ultimately, you know, 
it's all about what position those uh, quarterbacks are put into. Good point, because just like we talked about last night, Zach, in in uh, reference to Zach Allen, like, hey, what does his NFL story look like if he if he doesn't land with the Jets and he he lands in a maybe a little bit more fortuitous situation? But Clayton's jumping in to say, "What's up?" Okay, Bo Nix or JJ. So, if push came to shove, and you could, Michaela, trade up and and give up not only this year's first round, but probably next year's, maybe even a little something more to get to four. And then you get JJ or you can hold down the Ford at 12 and take Bo Nix. Which, which of those would govern your decision? Personally, I'm done mortgaging my future, my, my draft just to move up. We mortgaged so much already just now with, close to being back to normal. So no, I wouldn't want to move up. My preference would be probably stay at 12 because I wouldn't want to risk my player being gone yeah. if you move down. Uh, we've got Danny Powers jumping in on Facebook. Appreciate you, Danny. Uh, what do you guys think about drafting two quarterbacks this year? So, uh, Zach, I'll get your thoughts and we'll serve it over to Michaela too here. But like, let's say the Broncos hold down the fort. They stay at 12. They take Bo Nix. And then in the third or fourth round, you look up and, you know, Spencer Rattler still on the board. Uh, so they take Spencer Rattler. How would you feel? Or, you know, a different combination of quarterbacks, whatever. How would you feel about that, Zach and Michaela? Zach, you first. See, I'm okay with going double dipping at quarterback. Like you talked about, let's say Bo Nix at 12, but I wouldn't take another one so soon. They have so many needs throughout the roster, Chad, at edge rusher, inside linebacker, defensive end, yada, yada, that they really can't afford to burn two picks in the top three rounds on quarterbacks. Now, if they want to take a, a flyer in the sixth or seventh round, that would be okay to me. But I'm with Michaela. As long as they come out of round one with that cue, that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind. Depends how late you're talking about. Maybe uh, – as high as a fourth round, not any time, any sooner than that. Maybe get see if you can get the guy from Purdue. There's a uh, one kind of semi recent precedent for success on the drafting two quarterbacks thing, but you got to go all the way back to 2012 when Mike Shanahan and Washington took RG three at whatever that was number two, and then. I got to remind myself, I sometimes forget Kirk Cousins was a fourth round pick. And, you know, at first it looked like, well, wasted pick because RG3 went on to earn like rookie of the year honors. And if memory serves, Washington made the playoffs that year. But it was only after that, you know, when the injury bug started, started uh, plaguing RG3 and things started to unravel there that it turned out to have been a miracle and a very well-founded investment that Mike Shanahan also drafted Kirk Cousins that year even though he didn't stick around long term uh he did carry a lot of a lot of water for the for Washington for a few a few seasons post RG3 that he did and Michaela let's shift gears a little bit away from quarterback I have a an interesting question for you if you don't go Bo Nix at 12 or let's say you do go QB in round one what's the second biggest need in your opinion you know I mentioned at edge rusher you can argue cornerback maybe center where would you go after Q in this draft I would go edge rusher yeah same why is that because we really don't have a stud there. Yeah, we right. have a, a few serviceable people. I don't know if uh, Browning or will turn out or Bonito will turn out to be a stud. I kind of doubt it, but. <laughs> with David you. jumps in with a very nice super chat. Thank you, David. And he's wondering what QB you would want, Michaela. But she did answer that earlier. Her, her Q1 would be Drake May, even though she doesn't necessarily expect it. But, Michaela, anything else you would want to say on that subject for David here? I don't know. I'm kind of warming up to Bo Nix. He wants to be here. He's a little bit older, which in quarterback years, it doesn't matter as much. But I think he'll be more mature. 
you definitely have that aspect as far as his uh, relative. I mean, he's got a reputation for maturity. Plus, he's, you know, when you talk about the first round quarterbacks, the most experienced guy there. Um, mm -hmm. When you combine his SEC experience and the time at Oregon. But the one downside, one of the couple, you know, there's pros, there's cons to every prospect. One of the cons, so to speak, on Bo Nix is you got to hit the ground running with this cat. He can't be a two- or three-year project mm -hmm. because he's 24. He just turned 24. So that's a thing, right? Like, it's kind of affecting Garrett Bowles right now, different position, obviously, but, like, his relative value to the league. Yeah, he – what is it? 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 21. You know, so he's going into year eight, but he's already on the wrong side of 30, which – decreases his value as a player in terms of earning potential, decreases his value for the Broncos relative to trading him and whatnot. But how much does that bother either of you, the fact that Bo Nix just turned, by the way, not going to turn just barely in February, turned 24? I mean, I'll go really quickly. I want to just say that I've noticed a, a bit of a trend in writing up Ray Davis today, the running back workout from Kentucky. Um, didn't know much about him, but what I found out is that he turns 25 in November. So maybe maybe I'm looking too much into a chat or too deeply. Maybe there's not much there, but I don't think maybe Sean Payton isn't as put off by an older rookie as uh, we would make it seem. I think if they can play, they can play. And if they can fit his system, he wants them. What do you think, Michaela? Honestly, be, him being 24 and being a quarterback doesn't bother me at all because nowadays quarterbacks, they play in – or into their 40, so it yeah. doesn't really that matter that much. It's true. It's true. And as long as he hits a, uh, hits the ground running and is the right guy, I don't care if he's 24. Besides, uh, how many highly drafted quarterbacks nowadays really sit that much? I mean, doesn't happen. And even John Elway, before he was the guy pulling strings in a, in an NFL front office, was on record of saying, hey, you know, First round quarterbacks need to play. Uh, that's the only way to develop them is you play them. And to his, in his defense, he was trying to get Paxton Lynch on the field. Gary Kubiak was the one not feeling that. But that's, you know, that's water under the bridge. All right, Michaela, last question for you. And again, it's so awesome to catch up and and uh, shoot the breeze, the Bronco breeze, as it were. Um, last question for you. So we know what you kind of hope to see. We know, et cetera, some of the players you like in round one. But if you were to bet a car payment, let's say, on what happens for the Broncos, who they pick, who falls to them, or whatever, who, who the ultimate pick is for the Broncos in round one, who would it be? My money is on them drafting Bonix. I think that's a pretty safe bet for now, Zach. Yeah, I think so too. I would I would also wager that bet. Michaela, one more quick question if you could. I just I'm curious. You said that you don't want to mortgage the future and I don't blame you at all. You also love Drake May. I don't blame you at all, but would you kind of half mortgage the future? Let's say you don't go up to 4 for Drake May, but you can move up to 8 for Drake May. Would you make that trade? 8? Yeah. Yeah, I would. It wouldn't be that expensive. On the same page. Probably a 1 and maybe you could you could parlay next year's two, maybe that. Would that? What do you think, Scott? In today's uh, QB needy NFL, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny and interest on that number eight pick. Do you think a one, your a one, and next year's two would do it, or would that be too much? In the private chat, there we go. Yep, might be. We shall see. Um, Michaela, we love you. We appreciate you so much. We can't wait to, to do it again. Obviously, we'll be talking to you. Uh, quite a bit between now and the next MHH meet and greet. And of course, as soon as we actually have the schedule release, we're going to be announcing the the date for the meet and greet for 2024. But this year we're going back to the way we've kind of usually done it, which is sep late September, you know, getting it in early in the season, like within the first two or three games. So uh, we look forward to that, but thank you so much for, for coming on tonight, obviously, but also everything you do, what you mean to the community, what you mean to Zach and I and Scott and everybody, all the podcasts. So I hope you know how much we love you and how much you mean to us. And thank you for, for making time again for us tonight. Love you all. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Michaela. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there she goes. That's the Duchess uh, makes time for us. And uh, fittingly, 
She's the first one kicking off the superstar segments, and we're we're gonna have them rolling. Uh, we'll announce later this week who we've got for uh, next week on the superstar segments, and I think uh, you you guys are gonna be also excited by by next week's guest. It's gonna be a gas, but always fun catching up with the Duchess, Zach. Always, and uh, you kind of um, articulated everything I was going to say to her. She is such a foundational member and such a key member. We wouldn't be here without Michaela. And I found myself nodding in agreement to every point she made, Chad. I thought she was pretty much on the money with uh, what the Broncos should do in the draft. Exactly. Um, And she's always kind of blunt and direct about it. Frank, I think Frank, you know, Frank is the best way to describe it. Um, But just to, uh, to shift some gears here, Zach, I... Shame on me for not getting to this while uh, Michaela was on with us, but kind of interesting. So this is slightly old news in the sense that these remarks that I'm going to share from Saints head coach Dennis Allen were from uh, his time at the NFL owners meeting. But it was interesting. He was asked about the Broncos slash Taysom Hill rumors and then asked kind of point blank, have the Broncos reached out to you about Taysom Hill, who is under contract? Uh, and here's what he said, quote, no, that conversation has not been broached. Look, I feel like Sean has tried to get everyone to go to Denver with him. So we'll see, close quote. So Zach, on one hand, he's kind of being a little passive aggressive with Sean Payton's kind of getting the band back together thing. Uh, with with former Saints players and coaches landing in Denver, and then also kind of keeping the door open on the possibility of the Broncos eventually coming around and knocking on the on the door about Taysom Hill. Nothing passive aggressive here for Michaela showing her tremendous support of the podcast and and proving us correct in our praise for her. She says, thank you for having me. Love you all coming in red. Thank you so much, Michaela. I think I've said those words more than any other three words in my entire life. Thank you so much, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What more is there left to say about her, Chad? Did you have fun? I want to know that, Michaela. Did you have some fun? Uh, Was it an enjoyable experience? Because we always love chopping it up with you. Um, But I mean, MHH to the bone, even in her profile pic, she's rocking her Tim Patrick Jersey. That's another thing I forgot to bring up to Michaela was how excited she was that Tim Patrick's sticking around for at least one more rodeo this year. Yeah. Again, thank you so much, Michaela. And, and, you know, I just want to give my quick thoughts on the Taysom Hill thing. I don't know that it was a shot at Sean Payton chat. I think he's just being and using common sense and seeing the trend of Sean Payton hiring former Saints. I don't know that Taysom Hill would move the needle for Sean Payton. I don't think Sean Payton needs a Taysom Hill, especially if the goal, as stated, is to be in a rebuild with a rookie quarterback. You know, was he insulting Sean Payton? No. no. But it was it was a passive-aggressive shot. Like, do you need to comment on the fact that Sean Payton has hired a lot of your former players and coaches? You only comment if you're trying to say something, right? Like, if you're making a point about it. And if you're making a point about it, what point is it you're trying to make? I know it was on the subject of Taysom Hill. So the explanations that could simply be that, you know, he's speaking specifically to, to the Hill thing, but he goes, yeah, he's pretty much tried to bring everyone there. Well, look, Dennis, first of all, Sean Payton hired you in what was it, Zach? 20, uh, was it 2015, 2016 to be defensive coordinator? which he did a good job for him. You know, he held down that that side of the, the ball so Sean Payton and Pete Carmichael could do their thing on offense. And then when Sean Payton stepped down following the 21 season, the Saints did raise some eyebrows, Zach, by choosing to go with Dennis Allen as the head coach, kind of passing over Pete Carmichael, who, you know, for whatever it's worth, there were a lot of years when the, the coaching uh, carousel would come around and, his name, Pete Carmichael, would get floated. He always stayed. I don't know how much genuine interest around the league there was in him as a head coaching candidate, but it's kind of interesting that a Johnny come lately, so to speak, of Dennis Allen ends up you know, being the successor to Sean Payton, not actually one of his long-term lieutenants. But it was Dennis Allen and Mickey Loomis, the GM there, who decided to move on from Pete Carmichael. Uh, and the Broncos, of course, we knew it would happen, swooped him up like that. 
I'm pretty sure they're on good terms, Dennis Allen and Sean Payton, but they are opposing coaches, so they are enemies. And sometimes, as we saw with Nate Hackett and um, you know Sean Payton, you can throw barbs and be passive aggressive. We better be nice to Dennis Allen, though, Chad, at least publicly, because there's a decent chance that the Saints end up firing him at some point in the future. And there's a better chance that if that were to happen, he would be hired by Sean Payton to be defensive coordinator. And I would honestly take him a hundred times over over Vance Joseph. I don't know. You know, that's what got him his start in the league as a head coach guy uh, and elevated his profile was John Fox hiring him to be defensive coordinator in his year one in Denver back in 2011. And that defense was insane. You know, it predated uh, it predated D Ware and Tlaib, but it did feature a rookie Chris Harris Jr. Uh, who came on kind of the second half or was that 12? No, that was was Harris 11 or 12? Now I'm questioning myself. But anyway, you had Vaughn. Uh, you had, uh, oh, what was, uh, who was the middle linebacker? Well, you still had you still had Champ. It was a really good defense that, for whatever, it was perfect complementary unit, Zach, to the batten down the hatches. We're going to go from the uh, uh, Kyle Orton version of our offense, kind of a passing 11 personnel thing to like, we're going to bring it all in. We're going to become the number one rushing offense with Tim Tebow. Those two things complemented quite well, always played well in critical situations, took the ball away. So that got him his first head coaching job. The very next year he left to go coach for the the uh, Raiders. And then as soon as he was jettisoned from, from Oakland, it was still Oakland at the time, Peyton swooped him up. I mean, since we're talking about former Broncos coaches, Dennis Allen falls in the same bucket as like a Wade Phillips where they're not a great head coach, but they are a really good coordinator. And for that reason, again, if, if Dennis Allen is let go, Sean Payton should come a calling quickly. Yeah, it was 2011, by the way, uh, Chris Harris Jr. All right, all right, all right, cool. Look, a few messages here for uh, the Duchess. You know, she's, she's seeing it, but maybe not on Facebook. Joe Anthony giving Michaela some props, uh, of course. The Ronk saying Mikhail always brings great knowledge on the Broncos. Mike, you got to let us know, my dog. If you have, if you want to come on the show, we we've, we've reserved a spot for you. Let us know. DM us on on uh, Twitter X, whatever you want to call it, um, because we'd we'd love to have you on. We've never had a chance to. And if you can't, hey, or maybe it's just not your bag. Like not everyone, Zach, as passionate and knowledgeable and all that as as so many of our. Uh, audience and community members are not everyone wants to have a microphone in their face and a camera on them. It's not for everyone. We get that. So if it's not for you, Mike, we just hope you find a way to make it to the meet and greet later this fall. So hope, hope you've got that on your docket of possibilities and Colby saying way cool. She was spot on. I think Michaela. I think so. And anyone who's interacted with her at the meet and greet or anyone who's seen her on here before would, would, you know, acknowledge that as well. Michaela knows what she's talking about. And she's a lot of fun too in person. Yeah. Uh, I mean, she's not a lot of fun on the podcast, obviously, but I mean, in person, she's a lot of fun. Uh, Danny powers again. Thank you, bro. So you guys getting excited for these new uniforms two weeks from now. I uh, got a feeling they're going to be orange. Yeah. So the last little hint where they announced Zach, the official date that they'd be unveiling the New Jersey look, it was, you know, all like an, an entirely orange kind of, uh, graphic. So similar to when they were hyping up the snow capped thing last year, before they unveiled it, everything was white, right? White, 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 white. Um, so yeah, I think it's a pretty good indicator as Danny's saying here, Zach, that it's going to be a, a riff on the current orange color. They're not, sounds like, moving off orange as their primary home jersey, which that changed in 2012. I think it changed, if, I'm, if memory serves, year one of Peyton Manning uh, from the blue being their main home jersey to the orange being their main. I don't know if it was a hint, but the last update about the jersey actually came today. It was Pretty funny. Didn't expect it. The Broncos social media team put out a quick video featuring Miles, the mascot. And at the end, he was in the locker room wearing a robe and the robe came open and we see this big blur. You know, you can use your imagination for yourselves. Was not expecting that. So the Broncos social team is having fun with it. To answer the question, though, um, I'm not a big uniform guy. I'm kind of like, um, uh, you know, 
boomer when it comes to this. I, I don't care what the Broncos wear. I'm actually a fan of their current uniforms, though I understand the anticipation and the excitement for the new uniforms. Danny, I just want a winning product on the field. That's I don't care what they wear. That's all I ask, all I want. I'm still just a little superstitious about changing the helmet design anyway, which that's not really in the cards this year. That's not what this is about. But, you know, all the real success the team has had as far as reaching the top of the mountain, that's all come since 97 when they changed over to the new blue helmet with the newer Bronco, the flame mane, all that stuff. So anyway, Danny, appreciate you, big dog. All right, let me double check. We're at about 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to check a couple, see if there's any uh, – yeah, Jeremy. Hopefully we'll have new uniforms, new quarterback, and a new era officially in two weeks. Yeah, there's – you know, that would be nice, a nice little kind of herald, Zach, uh, to kick off the new era is you get a new take on the on the uniforms. You get your new future franchise quarterback. And really, even though last year was year one of Sean Payton as head coach, you know, this would be really like the first year of him fully fleshing out, beginning the, the build of what he envisions as – the Denver Broncos becoming a force to be reckoned with in the NFL again and and back to the level that everybody is fans. You know, that's why you became fans. I mean, it might, might not be why you became fans, but it's what you came to expect as Broncos fans for so many years under the late Pat Bowen. See, this is where I start to sound like a, an old man who's yelling at clouds because to me, one thing is not like not like not like the other here, Chad. New uniform is a new franchise quarterback. I don't care if they have a mountain theme. I don't care if they're snow capped. I don't care what they look like. If they get that franchise quarterback, that starts a new era, and that's the most important thing. So we'll see, Jeremy, how they look in two weeks. All right, we've got uh, the GLP jumping in with a generous super. Thank you, Gary. He says, I just got here. Sorry I missed you live, Michaela. I will watch later. I'm sure she's happy to hear that, my friend, that uh, you're in the house and you'll check it out later. I, I remember not this last not this last meet and greet, Zach. It was the year prior, so 2022. Pretty sure, Michaela, you'll have, to, you'll have to confirm on this if it was 22 or 21. I'm pretty sure it was 22, though. But we did uh, the that summer. We did like the red carpet thing. We got the two people, one from Facebook, one from YouTube. Uh, you know, hang out, all this stuff, and then the tickets to the game. They ended up kicking it together, watching that game. Gary and and Michaela. What was what was that game? Was that Jets Broncos Jets? Right, the first the, or the second year of the meet and greet. I'm pretty sure it was Broncos Jets, if memory serves, with Russ. Yeah. The first year of Russ. The first meet and greet. It was uh, Teddy. 21 21 that's 20 right so that rest. was jets that was the one that was jets so what was the 22 niners that's right niners on Prime sunday time. night football so now i'm confusing myself maybe it was the first one maybe I it think was the red carpet thing was 22 i might be wrong it was the second she's meeting. saying she's saying 22 okay cool you know i'm getting i'm getting old you know sometimes i got to be reminded of things just just ask the missus she'll tell you but Gary, thank you, big dog. Appreciate you. Um, we have here, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, the Ronk jumping in to say, I would give the Broncos new secondary coach, Jim Leonard, the first dab at defensive coordinator before bringing in a Dennis Allen. That's a really good point, Zach. That's a really good point because, I mean, even though Allen is technically now a Peyton guy, right? Like he's, would you say he, he, he springs off the Sean Payton coaching tree? You could in a technical sense or in a, maybe in a literal sense. But Jim Leonard now, I mean, is going to be a Peyton guy almost in the same sense, like having worked for him. And he was a guy that was like batting, you know, with a bat, offers to be defensive coordinator, be bigger jobs in college, and decided to take the cornerback, the secondary, I should say, job uh, in Denver. Yeah, I would not mind it. Um, Michael, Jim Leonard would be another tremendous upgrade on VJ. Who wouldn't be? Love the hire. I think that was the best hire in the Sean Payton era so far, arguably. 
But one thing I've noticed is it seems like he wants veteran assistance at major positions. He didn't go with the younger OC. He went with Joe Lombardi. He didn't go with the younger special teams guy. He went with Mike Westoff and uh, Ben Kotwika. He could have promoted Christian Parker. He didn't do that. Let him go. He hired VJ, who was an experienced coach. It just seems like for those major positions, he wants guys who've been there and done that. If it's Dennis Allen, though, if it's Jim Leonard, again, both would be uh, welcomed. And I think we all could agree that chat over VJ. Um, a quick shout out here to Big Earn, Broncos country only. Big Earn, everybody knows Big Earn. So good to see you tonight, Big Dog. Uh, Danny saying, I don't agree that when I don't agree that when I heard we're projected to win five games this year, I think we can pull out eight. Uh, I mean, we know who the opponents are, Zach. So you can kind of spitball together a, a prediction, but it's really hard to even do that until you know the order. But even then, with so much uncertainty and lack of clarity at quarterback, exactly, yeah. it's like, you know, you kind of are dead in the water till there's some kind of clarity there. And even if it's a rookie, whether it's a, a, a trade up and it's a McCarthy type guy, or if it's a hold down the fort or even trade back and still get a guy like a, like a Knicks or a Penix later, whatever, you know, I would say uh, based on what we've seen from Sean Payton, he outkicked his coverage last year with the team as was like improved on uh, improved on the previous win total by three games. I'm not going to discount him. Like I'm not getting my hopes up obviously on like, Hey, you know, winning the division and going to, to rec shop in the playoffs, but I'm not writing them off. I'm, I can't do it with, with Sean Payton, even if they indeed are starting over a quarterback. I've been burned severely two years in a row with record predictions. I'm going to refrain from that for the time being. And number two is, I like you said, until the, we know who the Broncos starting quarterback is at minimum, you really can't render anything. So cl as we get closer to the season, Danny, we'll give our, our record predictions. We'll do a schedule breakdown when it comes out in the next what month or so. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's a five win campaign. And it wouldn't surprise me if like Chad was talking about with Sean Payton's coaching magic, if they can pull off another eight and nine season. I wanted to get your thoughts as well here, Zach, on uh, Jared Cook had this write up for us at milehighhuddle.com. We'll have to get Jared on the podcast one of these days, uh, introduce him to the community because he he's uh, he's a grinder on the on the beat. He's a newer writer for us on uh, at MHH, but young dude knows what he's talking about. But he wrote up uh, today the Athletic, <clears throat> uh, Nick Baumgartner, a mock deal, you know, a mock trade in the draft. So Broncos trade down from pick 12 to pick 19. This is a swap with the Rams. They get pick 19 and number 52 overall. So it puts them into the uh, second round. And then, of course, the Rams get 12 overall. So you think 19, Zach, does that still put you within plausible uh, striking distance of Bo Nix? Or do you think if it's that far down, you got to basically – say goodbye to that as a possibility considering teams like the Raiders are like right behind you at 13. Exactly. I mean, there's still a chance that Knicks would be there, but I think you'd, you'd start to have to be considering Michael Penix, who's more of a sure thing to be there. What'd you say? It was uh 19 Chad. 19. Yeah. So that's why seven spots and picking up a second round pick. Is it really worth chancing out on what could be a franchise quarterback missing out on that guy? If there's any question, Chad, I'm staying at 12. I'm resisting that temptation to move down and I'm getting the guy that Sean Payton wants. Uh, Richard. With Broncos rebuilding in this off season, are we worried about making the postseason worried? No, you know, again, we're not, this time around, like you had a plausible reason, Zach, you had a credible reason to go, okay, Sean Payton is your head coach. Russell Wilson, after a down year with one of the literally most incompetent head coaches of all time, as evidenced, not only by his works, Zach, but by the fact that he's one of at when he was fired, one of two head coaches in the Super Bowl era to be fired before his first year was even up. Uh, you had reason to believe that good reason to believe too, Zach, that 2022 was just a blip on the radar. It was a setback. Sean Payton come in Russ. You know, there was enough pieces there to be a plausible playoff threat. I don't think anybody should feel too bad about themselves for expecting that last year, this year. It's like, Hey, 
you be just be reasonable in what your expectations are. Your expectations, obviously, as a Broncos fan, you're like, hey, playoffs, Super Bowl or bust. I get that. I'm talking about being reasonable, being realistic, and understanding what the team is telling you as a fan. When they cut Russ and they sent and they cut Justin Simmons, they're right. telling you, hey, buckle up. It's going to be painful for a minute while we rebuild this thing. So I don't think any fan should be Zach setting their heart on a playoff berth. But also, you don't want to completely discount it because, again, Sean Payton knows what he's doing. If I asked you a year ago or, you know, 11 months ago, the expectations for the Texans with a rookie quarterback, everyone would say they'd be one of the worst teams in, in the NFL. You don't know until you know. If you hit on that guy, uh, you can instantly become a contender. I'm not saying that, as Michael Ronquillo says, Bo Nix, that's who he wants. I'm not saying Bo Nix could be like a Stroud, but – What's the reason, Chad, arguably the Broncos got to 8-9 last season? It was the winning streak, and that was um, powered by the defensive turnovers they were forcing, the defensive play. Okay, well, let's say the defense takes a step back, as we think they will under VJ, but the offense counters that because you're not being held back by your quarterback. Your quarterback and your head coach are not at odds. They're on the same page. Even with the Bo Nix, that can kind of level off the whole team, and it wouldn't surprise me in the least, considering the three win advantage they got from going from Hackett to Sean Payton. It wouldn't surprise me if they are competing at some point this season. Yeah. And I would give, I mean, if you guys, I got a lot of people rolling their eyes when I would say this last year during the win streak, that there was just something Tebow esque about Russ kind of sucking it up for three quarters, three and a half, but then he would find a way to make just off schedule, big plays when the chips were down that combined with that historic, takeaway streak the Broncos went on explains the winning streak but it's not it was nothing it was fool's gold and it proved to be that and I think Sean Payton knew it was fool's gold we saw him you know uh chinks in that particular armor Zach when he was cussing him out Russ on the sideline I can't recall what game was that was Detroit. that yeah the Detroit game which was the first major like okay this is like the last game you can kind of afford to lose and still have like a really decent shot at making the playoffs because uh, it was an NFC opponent. But then it was the next week, right? The, it all came crumbling officially to the, to the ground when you lose on, on, uh, on Christmas Eve to, to the Patriots. Or was it Christmas? Christmas Eve. Yeah. Every year they ruin our holiday chat, don't they? And when we, that blow up first happened, we were doing the gut reaction that night and we were speculating what the impetus for that blow up was. Looking back on it, that was months of pent up frustration between a coach and a quarterback that wasn't playing to the confines of his system. And as we come to find out, it's, it was never going to work. It's just like Michaela said, it was a bad marriage that wasn't meant to be. Um, okay, I want to grab this from Jeremy. If we have time, we'll grab Marcus Lewis. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you for a minute, big dog. On YouTube this time, by the way, too. And then we'll probably dip out of here. So last call for any burning questions, supers, etc. Jeremy goes, I personally don't see why a rookie can't have similar production as Russ last year. Take less sacks. Don't turn the ball over. That's true. I mean, let's think about what Russ did. It was a massive improvement in the touchdown to interception ratio. He threw 26 touchdown passes. Barely got over 3,000 yards passing Zach before he was benched, but he was sacked 45 times. All right. A rookie quarterback, maybe you don't get to 26 touchdowns because a lot of those scores, if we're being honest here, a lot of them, a good chunk of them, I'd say maybe as many as a quarter of those touchdown passes were like flip a coin miracles where his receiver just made a killer play, right? And those, you mean, Cortland Sutton bailing him out on the reg. Um, so could a rookie. Maybe not as many touchdown passes, but you're still probably going to be significantly more on schedule as an offense. That means you're going to get a more complimentary brand of offense that's going to see other people have the opportunity, the actual means, Zach, to rise to the occasion and help carry some of the water for a rookie. Uh, and definitely a, the, the less sacks thing. And if you get a guy like Bo Nix, who is literally – the most experienced starting quarterback to ever leave the college ranks. He has 61 college starts, which is a record NCAA. You know, you can hit plausibly hit the ground running a, a little bit faster. And he's got some of that loosey goosey athleticism that people kind of sleep on uh, that would allow you to be a little more escapable in the pocket and, 
uh, ostensibly anyway, not take as many sacks. I think this is a good point. It's not necessarily one Zach that goes. And so everybody expect playoffs, but it is a little bit of a, uh, what would you call it? You know, reset in the frame just a little bit. That's why I said it was a leveling effect. If the defense takes a step back or can't have that turnover luck, the offense should be uh, more dependable and reliable from series to series and game to game. And, you know, you look at Russell Wilson's numbers last season, and on the surface, they aren't bad, but it goes beyond the numbers. How bad were they in the red zone? How bad were they in third down? Like you pointed out, Chad, a lot of their scores came on 50-50 balls or from the midfield, 40-yard line, just prayers. But how often as well were games the Broncos were losing and they were only they only had six, 10 points in the second half? How often did they not wake up like you hinted at earlier until the fourth quarter? It was not acceptable for a Sean Payton offense with a $250 million quarterback. So even if you lose the, the deep ball of Russell Wilson, you're going to gain more consistency in the short and intermediate areas of the field with a rookie quarterback like Bo Nix, and that should make the offense as a whole better. Like Bo Nix talked about in that podcast conversation with RG3, like, you know, the Sean Payton offense is the the passing game is very much an extension of the running game, which is a West Coast offense. Oh, yeah, I moved I moved my books. But it's a West Coast offense thing, right? It's a Bill Walsh thing. Uh, and here's another thing that you talk about improving over last year. It's pretty hard to find a quarterback, Zach, that's going to get that's going to fumble away as many balls as Russ did. So, um, you know, maybe it won't be as steep of a climb as as we might think. All right. Last question. Then we're going to dip from Marcus Lewis. Henna. Good to see you, big dog. One of our longtime supporters uh, from across the pond. This is a, a bona fide hashtag state of being a member of the community says evening, guys. Can we afford to let Garrett Bowles go considering the front line was quite bad last year? A great show as always. Thank you, big dog. Again, it's great to see you. Um, Zach, your answer for, uh, for Marcus. You can afford it if you have an immediate plan to replace Garrett Bowles. And what I mean by that is if you flip him for a third or fourth, the guy that you're drafting to replace him with that pick is comparable is either as good or will be better. Um, because no matter if it's a rebuild, Chad, no matter who's quarterbacking the team, you know, righty, lefty, you want that rookie to have solid protection, obviously. And left tackle is such a crucial uh, part of the offensive line. You might say it's the most important position. They're going to already have to replace center with Cushionberry or at least work in Forsyth to that starting role. Um, I don't think that Bowles is going anywhere at the moment, though, obviously, that could change during the draft. The Rock, appreciate you, big dog. Thank you, my friend. Much love and respect holding down the fort with us. Uh, I want to shout out the Randy up in Alaska. Good to see you, big dog. Hope you're doing well. It's been awesome seeing you in the chat lately with some big stars too. Thank you, bro. Thank you. So great to see you, Randy. Uh, Nick saying uh, Bo Nix has been in a lot of the draft talk. I'm just curious what are you really thought. I, if we were to bet on a quarterback right now, Nick, like who's the quarterback to if you're going to bet and like bet a car payment on which quarterback lands in Denver, we'd put our money on uh, on Bo Nix uh, for right now, but. We're out of time, guys. Thank you so much. We got a few messages for you. Don't dip out quite yet. Another tremendous installment of the Mile High Huddle podcast featuring the Duchess Michaela Parker. If you haven't done so yet, please follow us on Twitter slash X at the MHH pod. You can follow the main account on Twitter at Mile High Huddle, Chad at Chad and Jensen, myself at Kelberman NFL and Scott, our producer at Scout Kennedy. If you guys want some merch like like. We're rocking each and every podcast. Check out MHHmerch.com. Also, you can find us on Instagram at mile underscore high underscore huddle. If you're listening to this pod on Apple Podcasts, make sure you're leaving your football priest a five-star review for a chance to win some merch each and every single month. But if anything, y'all, please, as you know by now, subscribe, like, and share this video and every video you see on the MHH channel. It really helps us grow and reach more Broncos fans just like y'all. A special shout out and mile high salute to the great super chat superstars and supporters tonight. And we got to start with the Duchess who made an appearance. The first superstar uh, segment of 2024, the Duchess, Michaela Parker. We love you. Thank you. Uh, Sam Bam. Also the rock Danny powers, David Yunkin, uh, the triple C Colby C Collier, Gary Palmer, uh, we got also Randy Jones jumping in. So much love and respect. Thank you, guys. 
Zach and I, we are off until Thursday night. Scott, are you guys, uh, is there a BFB tomorrow or Thursday? Tomorrow? Okay, so you got the 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 Scott and Nick show back in full effect tomorrow on the bright Broncos for breakfast. Uh, and then, of course, building the Broncos tomorrow night, Mile High Insiders Wednesday night, and then Zach and I will be back on Thursday. So can't wait. We'll see what, what happens in the old newswire between now and then. So have a great start to your week, everybody. We'll see you Thursday night. Take care, and as always... Go Broncos.